This is the story of the modern, coal-burning steam locomotive. The story of its low first cost, its availability, its economical operation, and its versatility. Over the 2,154 miles of track, largely in mountainous territory, with a main line crossing both the Allegheny and Blue Ridge mountain ranges, roll modern coal-burning steam locomotives, the power selected and used by the Norfolk and Western to handle trains of all types. Steam locomotives, some of the largest and most modern, are developed and built by the railroad's mechanical employees in the Roanoke, Virginia shops. This type of streamliner handles all principal passenger trains. Let us look back and briefly review its construction. First, we look in the shop's foundry. Starting from scratch, we see scrap steel being charged into an electric furnace. The heat is melted, refined, and tapped into a ladle. An overhead crane moves the ladle to the floor where a prepared mold is poured. After proper cooling, the mold is opened, and here we see the casting. A driving wheel in the rough. After the grinding and machining, we next see the wheel and its mate mounted on the axle with the tires applied. All driving wheel axles of 116 of the road's modern locomotives are fitted with roller bearings. In addition to the driving journals, this class locomotive has roller bearings on all crank pins, crosshead pins, valve gear pins, and the journals of the engine truck, trailing truck, and tender truck wheels. The roller bearing application, plus cast steel engine bed, and complete mechanical and pressure lubrication, results in dependable performance, high availability, and low maintenance cost. From these steel billets, the rods are manufactured. One has been heated to the correct temperature. Now watch the die forging process on the 8,000 pound steam hammer. The alloy steel used, together with carefully planned and executed forging and heat treatment, results in a finished product with an average yield strength of more than twice that of ordinary carbon steel. The rods are next machined, polished, and plated. Boiler plates of the proper thickness and size are being fabricated for the boiler. They are sized and drilled, then are run through the rolls which form them to the proper shape for boiler shell courses. Following the rolling, the courses are placed in a normalizing furnace to relieve all internal stresses. The courses are sandblasted to remove the scales. Next, the shell courses are fitted together prior to riveting the seams. For the heavy riveting involved, no hand job will suffice. So the shell is picked up and placed on end in the so-called bull riveter. The ram of this machine is activated with hydraulic pressure and is carefully controlled between narrow limits to ensure the proper driving pressure. The fabrication of the all-welded firebox is being completed. It is placed in position in the boiler. 4,400 stay bolts are required to attach it to the outside shell or wrapper sheets. The application of the stay bolts, together with the flues, completes the boiler. It is moved to the erecting shop where it is placed on and attached to the engine bed. There, overhead cranes lift the boiler and engine bed as a unit and move it in position over the driving and truck wheels. The clearance between the axle housing and the engine bed pedestals is only 12 thousandths of an inch, which explains the extreme care being taken in lowering the engine to working position on the wheels. Completed, our new baby, engine 602, rolls out of the shop on her way to the roundhouse for service. 
She will pull the Pocahontas and the Cavalier, crack passenger trains between Norfolk, Virginia, and Cincinnati and Columbus, Ohio. Between Lynchburg and Bristol, Virginia, she will handle the New York, New Orleans Limited, the Birmingham Special, and the Tennessean trains. Let's follow her for one trip. The engine crew arrives and compares time. The time comparison is a familiar scene, but missing is the engineer's oil can. No, the modern steam locomotive does not depend on hand oiling for its lubrication. The engineer is supplied with neither grease nor oil. The throttle is open and she moves smoothly away from Roanoke, pulling the westbound Cavalier. 100 miles and she arrives at Bluefield, West Virginia. While standing for the station stop, the water supply in the tender will be replenished. Leaving Bluefield, she quickly enters the coal fields. Through this beautiful, rugged country, with her 27 by 32 inch cylinders, and 275 pounds boiler pressure, developing over 5,000 cylinder horsepower, she pulls as many as 12 cars over long grades as steep as 2%. We pass a typical modern coal mining operation. Williamson, West Virginia, 200 miles from Roanoke and still in the mountains. The stop is only long enough to discharge and take on passengers and change crews. 260 miles, and we stop at a roadway coaling and watering station. Here at one spotting, the tender's coal space and water space will be refilled. At Canova, here Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia join and these states give Canova its name. Now we leave the mountains of West Virginia and cross the Ohio River into Ohio. Along the Ohio River Valley, she speeds westward. With her 70-inch drivers, she was designed primarily to handle heavy trains over mountain grades. But when grades and curvature permit, she will run. How fast? Well, let's get on and see. On level track, she is flashing over the rails at 100 miles per hour. Portsmouth Freight Classification Yard and a portion of the hump where cars are motion weighed and classified by gravity. Portsmouth, Ohio. And she's made 312 miles since dispatchment from Roanoke and still requires no servicing. Crews are changed and we're ready for the last lap of 112 miles. Pulling into the station at Cincinnati, she completes a one-way trip of 424 miles and takes a breathing spell for one reason only. She has reached the end of the line, Cincinnati, the western terminus of the railroad. The modern steam locomotive, with all the refinements, represents a relatively low initial cost or investment, with corresponding low carrying charges. It is dependable in operation. It requires no specially trained men for its operation or maintenance. It utilizes the existing servicing and repair facilities. It requires no line of road repairs or supervision, and generally speaking, is available to the extent the operating train schedules permit. Our engine has had the fire cleaned, the tender filled with water, and the lubrication is now in progress. While the away from home terminal servicing will be completed in less than one hour, she must stand by two hours, awaiting the next schedule for the return trip to Roanoke handling the eastbound Pocahontas. During the late hours of night, she has swiftly retraced her way back east, and now in the early morning, is rapidly approaching Roanoke.
Roanoke, and home again. He is cut off and moved to the roundhouse for servicing. The Schaefer's crossing engine terminal at Roanoke was built to handle a dispatchment of 80 locomotives per day. With a wartime load of 140 per day, consisting mostly of large, heavy, articulated engines, the one roundhouse and one turntable proved adequate only because the engines are of modern construction. Remember this arrival time at the engine terminal, 11-1. This engine will move at the regular routine pace with no special moves or shortcuts. The first operation is on the ash pit, where the grates are shaken and the ash pan cleaned. From the ash pit, the engine is moved to the inspection pit. Here, mechanics with years of experience having taught them just where to look for possible trouble, go over, around, and under her, making a thorough examination of all parts. The inspection completed, the engine is moved to the coaling station for sand and coal. The sandbox has a capacity of approximately 11 bushels, assuring ample sand for long runs. From the box, traps deliver sand to each individual driving wheel. Next, from the sand spot, the engine moves down to the coal chute, where the tender is filled to capacity. She moves to the engine washing platform, where the engine is washed off with hot water containing cleaning materials. At the same time, the tender is filled with water. Before making the next move, we must know what repairs, if any, are necessary. We find the engineer in the register room filling out his report, and the veteran inspector in the inspector's office filling out his. The engineer's report reflects the performance of the locomotive while in his charge. The inspector is responsible for detecting any defects that may escape the notice of the engineer. Finishing his report, the inspector places it in a cartridge and sends it by pneumatic tube to the roundhouse foreman. First, the engineer's report comes in. He has reported her okay. But that is not unusual. There are 11 of these engines in service. They are handled by 42 different engineers each day, and rarely are more than two or three items reported. The inspector who is trained to find work has only reported lubricate engine. With this information, the foreman gives instructions to turn the engine, but not to place it in the roundhouse. So from the washing platform, the engine moves to the turntable. Just a few years ago, an engine after completing a run of only 100 miles was kept in the roundhouse from several to as many as 12 hours for necessary repairs before again being dispatched. And yet, here is the modern steam engine passing up the roundhouse after a round trip of 848 miles. She now leaves the turntable headed for one of two engine service sheds where she will get a complete and speedy lubrication. While she pauses at the opposite end, we look through the length of the service shed. The valve and engine oils are supplied this building from the oil house. These pumps lift the engine and valve oils from underground storage tanks and maintain a supply under constant pressure in the pipelines. Outside the oil house, the two oil lines are encased in a single conduit which carries a small steam tracer line to prevent congealing of the oils in cold weather. Extending to each of the engine service sheds, 
the lines branch out to the four hose stations on each side of the building. The stations are located so that any part of any class locomotive headed in either direction can be reached by the hose of one of the stations. Back of this shield are the pumps and piping, which handle three other lubricants from the shipping containers and feed them under pressure to the lubrication stations. A view of one of the stations shows the drop hose. Each has a different fitting for its particular lubricant. From left to right, there are valve oil, engine oil, star or soft grease, Marfac, a semi-fluid grease, air for hard grease rod cup lubricator, and gear or extreme pressure oil. Since all types of locomotives, conventional as well as roller bearing, are worked in this shed, a cabinet is provided for the storage of hard grease forms and rod cup grease. Minor repairs can be made to the locomotives while being lubricated. To expedite this work, a small quantity of material and necessary hand tools are kept available in this cabinet. The foreman is provided with a small enclosed office. Both a telephone and the pneumatic tube system are provided to afford ready communication with the roundhouse. Our engine moves in the shed and over the pit. As she stops, the hostler observes the time, 11.56 or 55 minutes since the engine arrived on the ash pit. The lubrication men take the hose carrying the proper lubricant for each of their individual requirements, and the job is started. This man is filling the valve oil mechanical lubricator. On the right side of the engine, a similar lubricator is being filled with engine oil. The two carry sufficient oil for a run of 1,300 miles. They deliver oil to 220 different points. Five bearings of the valve gear are lubricated with soft grease each dispatchment. The remaining bearings require lubrication only at 15-day intervals. To make the lubrication foolproof, the slip fittings are designed so that the bearing fitting will accommodate only the fitting of the pressure hose supplying the proper lubricant. The rod and crank pins, as well as the crosshead pins, are all roller bearing. They are lubricated with extreme pressure oil. The oil cavity in the bore of the pins has sufficient capacity for a run of 500 miles. While we have observed this side of the engine, the other side has been completed. The air brake and final inspection made, all completed at 12.7, only 11 minutes in the shed, and only one hour and six minutes since she arrived at the shop. One hour and six minutes servicing after a round trip of 848 miles. Moving to the outgoing track, ready for the next dispatchment. Later, the engine crew reports to man her for the next trip. Note the time, 12.45, back in service after one hour and 44 minutes at her home maintenance point. These engines, with an assignment of approximately 15,000 miles per month, must be dispatched promptly. From Roanoke to Bristol, Virginia, handling the westbound Tennessee. The low initial investment, the low maintenance cost, the high availability, and the highly dependable performance of the streamlined passenger engine are shared by larger units, which also exemplify a high degree of adaptability and versatility.
Now let's see what this modern, all-purpose, simple, articulated engine is capable of doing. First, she handles a merchandise freight train from Roanoke to Williamson, a distance of 200 miles over two heavy-grade districts. After quick servicing, she is dispatched handling a tonnage train of coal to Portsmouth, Ohio. Meeting her sister with 175 empty coal cars, we see her in the Ohio River Valley with her tonnage, a train of 13,000 tons moving along at 42 miles per hour. With roller bearings on all wheels, 300 pounds boiler pressure and 70 inch drivers, she has available 6,300 horsepower at the drawbar. Leaving Portsmouth, she handles a 5,200-ton fast merchandise train to Columbus over a district of some favorable grade conditions, but with a ruling grade of 3 tenths percent and 10 miles long. At Columbus, the end of her westward run, she stands for a mixed equipment train. Eastward with this train, the engine makes a through run of 410 miles to Roanoke. She is proving her versatility by being adaptable for any class of service. After the 820-mile round trip, she also passes up the roundhouse. Following the fire cleaning, inspection, sanding, coaling, watering, and washing, she enters the engine shed. Here the engine will get the same speedy servicing given the streamliner. The lubricators are filled as before. The valve gear bearings are similar to those on the streamliner and are lubricated in a like manner. Instead of high dynamic steel rods with roller bearings, this engine is equipped with carbon steel rods with conventional bronze bearings. Therefore, the old grease is used as a lubricant. The rods are equipped with pressure fittings to take the pneumatically operated grease gun. The servicing is completed. She moves out of the engine shed to take her place with a streamliner, ready for their next road trips. They are pictures of low cost motive power, cheap to operate and maintain, dependable in service with a high ratio of availability, versatile in ability to handle various type of trains, and all without heavy capital expenditures for terminal and roadway facilities. This is the modern coal-burning steam locomotive. <laughs>